Okay, we have a few people coming in yet, but we will go ahead and get started right now. Can you hear me all right? Okay, great. Um, and I want to welcome you all to uh, the 10th year, the beginning of the 10th year of the Diane Merrick Visiting Artist Series here at UTC with our um, artist for fall 2015, Carmen Papalia from Vancouver, Canada. Um, I must apologize because my colleague, Ron Buffington, the head of the Department of Art, is unable to attend tonight because he's traveling on the behalf of the university and the Department of Art. Um, but he would welcome you all here t as well and, sell, and say some wonderful things about the Diane Merrick series <laughs> and what, what it means to the Department of Art, to the university, and to the community of Chattanooga, uh, and how truly fortunate we are and we feel to have this opportunity to bring artists from across the country or from the backyard, um, you know, from the state next door, uh, to Chattanooga for five to seven days, a visit that entails activities with students, activities with community, um, and a public lecture, such as the one we have here tonight. Um, and uh, it's, it's been a true honor to be associated with this series, uh, to see how it's raised the profile of the press and the university over the years in terms of the arts and the visual arts, uh, the kind of respect it has, a growing respect throughout the Southeast region, um, and uh, I'm just so glad that you all can share with that, that with us tonight. So we have Carmen Papalia here. Carmen uh, is a social practice artist who creates participatory projects on the topic of open access as it relates to public space, the art institution, and visual culture. And ultimately, Papalia works to build and promote trust, as the artist's own access is defined by visual impairment. I know that Carmen um, joins me in acknowledging uh, his Chattanooga collaborators for their contribution to the production of several works in the exhibition currently in the crest that you'll see in, uh, in just a little while. Uh, the Students enrolled in K Profe uh, UTC Assistant Professor of Art Katie Hargrave's Art 1999, Intro to Contemporary pra Art Practices. Uh, the students enrolled in University Honors 1010 <coughs> Humanities, uh, that is a UTC Associate Professor of English Sybil Baker's class, uh, who served as verbal translators for See for yourself. The faculty of UTC Department of Art, Professor Ron Buffington Head, uh, who guided the 14 art majors, uh, members of Papalia's visual translators team. And of course, the staff of the UTC Disabilities Resource Center, Michelle uh, Riegler, director, for their support and their role as audio descriptors for the See for Yourself project and the Hunter Museum of Art, who openly made their, uh, their collection accessible as source material for the translators, the visual translators, the verbal descriptions, and the audio descriptions for the See For Yourself project. Um, so there have been a lot of people involved uh, with this exhibition and with Carmen's uh, efforts here, which is a, a wonderful thing to have such um, a, a widespread collaboration and such depth of collaboration as well. <coughs> Carmen Papalia's work has been featured as part of exhibitions and engagements at the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum, the Muse Museum of Modern Art in New York City, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Los Angeles Craft and Folk Art Museum, the Q Foundation in New York City, the Grand Central Art Center at California State University Fullerton, 
the Portland Art Museum, and the Vancouver Art Gallery, among others. He is the recipient of the 2014 Adam Reynolds Memorial Bursary and the 2013 Wynn Newhouse Award and holds a Bachelor of Arts from Simon and Fraser University in Vancouver and a Master of Fine Arts from Portland State University. In early 2015, Papalia served as artist in residence at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London and at the Model Contemporary Art Center, Sligo, Ireland, where he assumed the role of access coordinator making site-specific interventions in response to the long history of disabling practices at each institution. He recently finished a project in collaboration with, the Sarah, Hendren, with Sarah Hendren and her students from the Franklin W. Olin College of Engineering to develop an acoustic mobility device. Uh, his upcoming work for a new accessibility, a convergence of artists and activists will take place later in November in Vancouver, where Carmen lives in works uh, in British Columbia. So without any more from me, let's bring Carmen Thanks. here. Thank you, Carmen. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, um, this is just, I'm so happy to be here. I just have to say thank you to a few people first before I get into my talk. Um, the Diane Merrick Visiting Artist Series and, and the program, that whole collaboration, super unique and rare uh, to find opportunities like that. So I, I really want to acknowledge um, Diane, the Diane Merrick um, series, as well as uh, Ruth Grover, such a super advocate for my work, and all the staff at UTC um, that are working with uh, students on the See for Yourself project um, and, and the open access uh, protest signs. Um, and also uh, students, like tons of students who participated in See for Yourself and the Open Access Project. So thank you all, and thank you all for being here. This is like um, an amazing opportunity to share my work and ideas with you, so thank you. Um, before I get started, basically my talk, I'm going to talk about the work that I've been doing for the last few years. Um, just before I went to grad school at Portland State, um, and then throughout my, my, um, you know, my grad experience at Portland State, and then kind of leading up to what I'm currently doing. But before that, I like to do this exercise before I start talks usually, just to get a sense of like who's in the room, where they're all at, um, and it's just going to take a few seconds. So basically, what I'd like to do is. Um, if everybody feels comfortable to uh, close their eyes, if everyone could close their eyes. Just get comfortable in that space. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set off this like chain reaction. So I'm going to say my name. And after I say my name, I want someone to jump in and say their name. Then after that person says their name, I want someone else to jump in and say their name. And I want this to go like rapid fire. So. Uh, we can get through this in a few seconds. I know there are a lot of people. Um, and until everybody's just said their name once. And so we're going to try to do this quickly. And it'll just kind of like whenever you feel like you want to say your name, say your yeah. name. <laughs> Carmen. Ruth. Is that everybody? Really? Oh, thank you. OK, you can all open your eyes. Yeah, sometimes people linger on to the very end of that. Um, but oh, I've never been with a group that like just it all explodes at the beginning, like it did today. Um, <laughs> maybe that's a good sign. Um, all right, so yeah, so the image, I'll start with this image here. This work is from um, two, oh, 2009, and that was before I got into grad school. 
I, I mean, it was around this time where I was really thinking through my position as a disabled person and what that all means. And I was still kind of like struggling with language that was being kind of like projected onto me. And I, and I hadn't yet like developed my, my own language, so set the, my own terms around, you know, my position. So what you're looking at is this project that I did, and at the time I called it a an experiment. I didn't even call it a performance. I didn't really identify as an artist. I was doing this creative writing degree in studying English literature in Vancouver. Um, and what you're looking at is my best friend, uh, Elliot, uh, who allowed me to disable him. Um, so this was when I was thinking through my own access and you know, the, the word disabled, and like where does that come from, and what, what is a disabled experience? And at the time, I didn't really know other people who identified as disabled. Um, I wasn't connected to like a disability community, and I was really, I really felt alone in this whole like identity crisis. So I just asked my friend Elliot if he'd allow me to like affix this corrugated sign to him and disable him essentially and he identifies as like an able-bodied person he you know is really proud of his you know health and fitness and he basically I affixed the sign to him with these like you know zap straps uh, that kind of like it impaired his his movement as well as his vision and his hearing in certain situations and basically what his job was that day was to just do like perform the you know his daily routine so he went like he tried to board a bus at one point and he wasn't able to he was too much of an obstruction for people so he wasn't able to board the bus uh, he tried to have lunch at this restaurant and he kind of struggled to like fit into this booth um, that he was eating at um, and he just had to like walk and you know he went shopping uh, as you can see and um, he, you know, was a spectacle. I mean, all these things that related to experiences that I was having. So after this experience, like Elliot and I talked about, you know, what his experience was all all like, and um, we started sharing, and uh, we really realized that a disabled experience is one of a limited or particular access to things. So like, I, Elliot's access was like, you know definitely changed by this, you know, modification. It was like a simulation, but still, like, he had trouble, he had to really account for, like, the size of his body in relation to the way, like, a door frame uh, was designed, for example. And it was just, like, a lot of the things that I was experiencing with my access changing. Um, I was, at the time, just starting to use a white mobility cane and at the time it was a, a cane that it was like this you know thing that you get from like the you know blind society or whatever organization in town I mean every city has one um, hopefully uh, and uh, and they give you this thing and it's white and red and you kind of like use it to tap around um, and I you know when I started using one I didn't, I mean, I didn't feel like it really, I wanted to identify through that, that symbol because it was connected to this institution that had very particular ideas around like independence and like how I should reintegrate into society. And like, I mean, in the first place, like I was, I was carrying this thing and like just by holding, you know, just while holding this, this, this thing, I was like automatically put in a different category, like my body was being read as being different from my peers. So I felt like this big gap between myself and other people and it just, you know, just after picking up this thing that was supposed to help me be more independent. So I was always feeling uncomfortable about the thing. And so I started making more experiments and this is also from 2009. And here's me unfurling um, a 15-foot mobility cane. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I made a 15-foot cane, and at the time I thought of it as an experiment. I would walk different walking routes in the city that I was at at the time, which was Vancouver. And, you know, when I would walk, I would, like, you know, be tapping this thing, and I would take up the entire sidewalk, and, like, people would be jumping out of my way. Um, 
<laughs> and, you know, and again, it was at this time where I didn't know that many, you know, blind or visually impaired people. I just knew that I didn't like the way that that thing positioned me. And the other thing was, like, it's this, it's almost like this beacon for other people to, it like attracts people to you. Like, people are off, you know, always offering help. And for the most part, like, I didn't really need help. Like, I, I just wanted to explore in the way that I was able to explore and just ask for help if I needed it. So I, you know, I ended up playing with that. And I thought, you know, it was during that time, too, that I was really frustrated with the design of the city. Like, I was constantly bumping into things and, like, you know, just the idea that like I could be walking and like using this thing for my own mobility, but then people could be like, you know, just, it almost created a force field around me. And with this project, I was just expanding that force field. And, um, and I know like it, it's sort of antagonistic, but it was also like a very frustrating time. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, like, I also wanted to, like, my, my, where my heart was at that time was wanting to start conversations with people about mobility and institutional symbols and, you know, po power structures. Um, but, you know, I guess I took an approach that was, like, nobody was sticking around long enough to talk to me. So, so I, I kind of questioned my, my methods. Um, and this has been like a lifelong, well, I mean, not lifelong, but like, uh, you know, around, I think I was like about 21 or 22 when I started using a cane. And, um, and I've been modifying it ever since. Like the first modification that I made is I had this cane at the time with this rolling ball tip on it. It was just like, you kind of roll, like you, you, you know, you use it. I mean, it's, it's something people will use to like, like hiking so like it'll just like bounce off of like an obstruction it won't give you like every little detail about what's in front of you so at that time my girl my partner at the time she painted like an eyeball on the the, the the ball so like when I was using it it would just like roll around and kind of you know comically creep people out um, um, this is how my my cane looks now um, I, it, it's a graphite cane that it used to be white and red, but I just peeled off all the white and red tape and it's like this nice black color. Um, and uh, I just added this wooden handle to the top. So it's like more fits in with the kind of thing I want to be. It interrupts that s signal that, you know, is kind of constantly shouting out to everybody that like this person needs help, this person needs help. So it kind of like, I don't get so many people asking me if I need help anymore. Um, and I don't feel like I'm connecting myself to an institution that I don't r really believe in. So, and it's funny, like, you know, this thing is supposed to s indicate, you know, this person is blind or visually impaired, but <laughs> it, it's constantly mistaken for other things. Like, my cane, like, people have thought it was like a metal detector before. Um, or, you know, someone's thought it was like a hiking stick. Well, yeah, this looks like a hiking stick, I guess. But, like, there's been some real outrageous ones, too. Um, and at one point, I, I've been thinking of, like, what do I, how do I work through this with my art practice? And so, you know, last year, I kind of sh shared with my friends, like, on Facebook, like, what, what the things are that it's been mistaken for. And I asked them a question. If you didn't know what it, this was, what would you think it is? And so I have a bit of a list. It's like I consider it a poem, but it's really a list of the things that my friends might think this thing is if they didn't know what it was. And um, uh, Liberty's going to read that for you. Things my cane might be hiking stick, tent pole, metal detector, hash pipe, straw, <laughs> broom. Javelin, oar, paintbrush, spear, tripod, camera, chopstick, flagpole, antenna, skewer, dildo, pencil, candy cane, selfie stick, spaghetti, two by four, fluorescent bulb, conduit, roasting stick, sage's staff, magic wand, clothing rod, cat toy, Muzzle loader, dowsing rod, sword, flute, digger a 
canoe paddle, polo mallet, hockey stick, antler, paint roller, sheep herder's staff, picking pole for harvesting fruit, feather duster, back scratcher, flask, headmaster switch, measuring stick, toothpick, thermometer, lightning rod, pole vaulting pole, conductor's baton, Q-tip, packing slash drafting tube, blow dart weapon, curtain rod, lacrosse stick, bread knife, halberd, rake, hoe, horse whip, crutch, fishing pole, balancing pole, glacier probe, microphone boom pole, soil sampler, joint, survivor's pole, surveyor's pole. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I don't know what I'm going to do with that list, but I like sharing it sometimes. <laughs> so we're kind of like, you know, time traveling here. This uh, image is from 2013, and it was when I did a residency at the Grand Central Art Center in Santa Ana, California. And I kind of just developed this project, and it started as like me joking with my friend. And I basically, I was like, you know, what if I, instead of using a cane, I used a marching band to get around. Um, and so I guess um, this curator that named John Spiak kind of like uh, uh, called my bluff and, and said, okay, like we'll get you a marching band. And, <laughs> and so I ended up working with the Green Great Centurion Marching Band from Century High School in Santa Ana, California. Um, and over six months, um, we kind of like connected over Skype. There was this uh, marching band director as well. And um, I basically like the students ask me these questions about like, what are the things that I might encounter while I'm on a walk? Like, what are some of my walking habits? Um, and then they went off and like made musical cues for those things. So like, for example, a step down is encountering like a curb or like a step down onto a street. They made this like note change and it would go, da, da. Oh, no, no, that was a step up. Sorry. It was like, sorry, it was like, da, no, da, 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 da. So, but if I was walking like up a set of stairs, for example, it would be like, Da, 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 da. And like there was also like objects and obstacles that like maybe, you know, the tuba player would run up to this object and kind of like blast the tuba. And then I'd know to stay like away from the, tu the, the thing. Um, and, and it was kind of just like this fluid thing. So we had been talking, you know, on Skype for about six months. But when I got there, we had this like 10 minute rehearsal. Um, and just like kind of got to learn how to like move together and um, like in the high school parking lot basically and I was like pretend this is a street you know like how will we encounter you know this situation and so we just played around and then on the day of the performance we just kind of like got right into it and like throughout the performance learned how to like work together and and the marching band director was like like amazing and he ended up like kind of working between me and the band, trying to anticipate where I might go, because it was like important for me to have like agency in this exchange there. I could like explore wherever I wanted to explore. And I, I didn't have like prior knowledge of the city before I went there. So I really was getting my first view of this place with a marching band instead of a white cane. And it was a really fun performance. Um, is this still a marching band image? OK, cool. So um, I'm going to share a video now. Um, I ended up developing this rendition of this, this project's called Mobility Device. And um, I ended up going, doing this residency at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London uh, in January and ended up doing a version of Mobility Device there in the gallery. So I'm just going to show like a really short documentary about that that project.
My name is Carmen Papalia and I'm artist in residence at the Victoria and Albert Museum through a partnership with Shape Arts. I started visiting the museum as a resident artist and I realized that it was just such a massive space and it was so difficult to navigate independently. So I really wanted to make a work about my movement through the different galleries in the museum with agency and independently. Mobility Device is a project series in which I replace my cane with some other system for my mobility. Tonight I'm going to replace my white cane with uh, Alison Craig, who is a Foley sound artist for the BBC. Carmel was quite keen to work with a Foley artist and I work for the BBC in radio and it's actually called Spot, the Foley work in radio, uh, which is uh, sound effects basically. This was an exchange of trust between Alison and I, and I was kind of like trusting her to curate sound in such a way to guide me through the museum. So with each gallery, Alison and I uh, co-developed like a sound palette that related to either objects in the room or perhaps like the layout of the room. One of the galleries that included a painting uh, that was a seascape, we essentially exploded that detail out into an entire soundscape that occupies the gallery space. And this ranged from the bell that you might hear from a boat. We had a wind machine, we had flapping sails, we had rain effects, we had all sorts of elements. Then when we went into the next space, which had pictures of animals, we gave out birds to people in the audience for them to provide an ambience of bird song. Whenever he went near objects or glass cases, I would flap a pair of gloves, which is a foley trick for when you're recreating the sounds of bird wings. And I was squawking like a mad one on this acne squawker that I had that sounds like a crow. I really got a sense of how sound should have worked to, to guide my movement and I kind of like could establish the perimeter of the space. <laughs> it's, it's really something that I feel like I'm going to continue to do. There's more to come. It's, it's an experiment that I want to return to. And so in 2010, I um, moved to Portland to go to grad school. I moved from Vancouver. I didn't know much about Portland when I got there. I kind of didn't know like those things you probably should know, like the route from you know my apartment or your apartment to 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 the grocery store or to school. I mean that was the reason I was there. I didn't know how to get there. So I mean it was this process of learning the city and I really had to kind of figure out like what was this I mean it seemed like a fresh start it almost was like this moment where I was able to reflect on how I did things and you know how you know how I actually interpret a place and you know what is actually going on there with my learning process so I started to think about you know the, the, the ways that, like I, I, you know, maybe like the ways that I would have done things in Vancouver. I mean, I grew up in Vancouver, so it was a different situation. Like my vision was changing over like a period of time. And I still like had this like real sense of where things were um, in Vancouver from like a long history of living there. But with Portland, it was like, you know, everything at once. And so I really had to figure out strategies for getting around different places. And one of the first things that I ended up doing was I took a camera with me and every time I bumped into something I took a photo of it. And so it was just like choosing this like kind of like funny process attaching it to like this unfortunate circumstance of me bumping into things. And so and there were a lot of things that I bumped into. So like I had pictures of like fire hydrants and like you know brick walls and like tree branches and stop signs and all sorts of stuff and at the end I had this like archive of these images of things that kind of fall into the background for most people usually um, but they were kind of like the things that I had these physical interactions with and so I learned my way through the city based on this like totally different way of moving through it 
um, you know, through my tactile sense, essentially. Um, and I started figuring out like how it is, like how, how could I describe my learning style and like bring other people into it. And I mean, this was all coming at a time of like, you know, being unsatisfied with like language that, you know, I'm often positioned with like, you know, the word blind, I've never liked that word. The word visually impaired, I've never liked that word. I mean, for example, like the word blind, like in the way, you know, we, we have sayings, like it's built into culture almost, like where, you know, seeing is believing. Like if you're not seeing it, you know, it's not real. <laughs> um, and, and that's not my situation. Like I, I can still listen to things and they're still real. Um, but, you know, I just was trying to figure out like, well, okay, there's enough cultural, social baggage, with, you know, with the, attached to the word blind that I didn't want to use it. And impairment as well, like it refers to a part of the body that's not working. Um, and I don't want to like, I didn't want to like start relationships and like introduce myself like saying, hey, my eyes don't work, function the same as yours do. <laughs> and I just was really looking for like, what is the common ground between myself and other people? And because um, like all that other language like felt really isolating and alienating. So I ended up thinking of myself as someone who learns through their non-visual senses. So I started you know, calling myself, identifying as a non-visual learner and really thinking of, you know, and people ask too, like, you know, me, uh, I mean, I don't know, sometimes people ask me like, what, like, when did you go blind? And, you know, first off, I don't use that word to describe myself, but I mean, I don't think that I lost anything when my vision started changing. Like it was, my response usually is, well, I actually chose not to see, like I actually had to choose for vision not to be the center of my learning or the goal with a particular situation. So like I was just really <laughs> embracing and accepting my access, which is, you know, you know, I access the world through my non-visual senses. And so I really wanted to like in grad school, really like figure out the potential in that um, learning style and, you know, in, in that practice. Um, this is still a marching band image? Yeah? Okay. Okay, so in early on when I got to Portland, I uh, went on this field trip to the Ape Caves in, on Mount St. Helens, and that's in Washington. It's like this series of like lava tubes, like caves that were like, I guess lava like carved out these, these tunnels, and you can like, like hike through them now. And they're kind of like, there's like underground streams and like stalactites and stalagmites and, you know, like part points through these caves where you have to like kind of like shimmy through on your belly, like under really claustrophobic sort of stuff. Um, and I don't know, I was a bit apprehensive going in, <laughs> but I went with a few like newly made friends, uh, just like the cohort that, you know, in the social practice or MFA program that I was enrolled in. And, um, and, and usually like I have like a degree of like shape and light perception. So like I can kind of, I mean, depending on the lighting situation, um, I can kind of pick out like where an object is sometimes. I don't know what it is. So I usually have to like hit it with some, my cane or, you know, like figure out like by deduction what the thing is. But like in the cave, it was like completely dark like most people were using headlamps but that wasn't working for me so I had to like just hold the shoulder uh, or sorry the elbow of, of a friend and they would guide me through and kind of like you know develop this like sighted guide practice while we're we were in the cave and you know after about 20 30 minutes of doing that like I almost didn't need a guide and I was just using my cane and like eventually just like feeling the walls and stuff and just like f you know getting a sense of like what the spatial scale was of this cave and like I was walking independently by the end of it and it was this thing that once I got to ground level and I was like reflecting on it I was like that I fe felt the sense of accomplishment and you know wh whereas I was like had to devote all my trust to this person that I don't, didn't know that well um, you know, to get me through this cave safely. Um, 
um, and and it and it worked. And and so my I guess like my impulse was to share that with my friends. And so I wanted to put them in a situation where they had to trust me completely, which is kind of, I mean, it was just this role reversal. But um, it, I and I did this for like a, I guess it was like a term, like a term project. Uh, we had all present our work in class and. I ended up just telling people to meet me outside of the art building and I told them that I was going to take them on an eyes closed walk. And so I told everyone to line up behind me and link arms and close their eyes and that I'd take them on a walk. It was about 15 minutes long and I ended up taking them to this like pod of food carts. Like Portland has like a ton of food carts and it's kind of known for it. But anyways, we went to these food carts and once we were there I was like, okay, keep your eyes closed. and and explore, explore like for 15 minutes and then, you know, I'll be here, I'll be tapping my cane, find your way back to me. And I, I realize now just how like unfair of a situation that was. <laughs> and it was like, you know, such a, a pretty tall order. Like I was asking them to trust me in taking them on this, you know, walk, kind of pushing them out of their comfort zone. But then to ask them to like walk independently without like any other, you know, assist of, device or, or whatever, uh, or training, um, is sort of unfair, but, but they did it and they, and I mean, and you kind of really saw how the different ways that people problem solve a situation. Like there was a little group that they were just like hugging this like what, what, mailbox um, and like a newspaper box <laughs> and they, they didn't leave that spot for like 15 minutes. And, and there was another group of people who, found their way to like a taco food cart and they actually ordered food and like they, you know, they, and then when they had to pay for the food, they realized that, oh, I have to like trust someone to tell me how much money I have. And, you know, it was like this whole just like problem solving, like learning experience. And it was really like overall positive. So I ended up doing this more and more just in Portland. I would like say, I would like put a thing in Craigslist or Facebook. I just like to the general public, just like I'll be in this place at a particular time on the weekend leading eyes closed walks. Like, you know, show up if you want to walk with your eyes closed. <laughs> and, and lo and behold, people would show up. And, you know, sometimes it was like a handful of people, like six people, but sometimes it was like 20 people. And it was just like this thing that people were just showing up to do because they, I mean, and it was Port, it's Portland too. I mean, they, they're kind of just keen on the un unorthodox so um, yeah and so I started doing these walks just in the public and then I started being asked to do them um, for like exhibitions and gallery shows and stuff and my first walk was in uh, Oakland California um, and it was at the Pro Arts Gallery which is right beside where Occupy Oakland was set up um, and so I took this group of people on this eyes closed walk through like downtown Oakland and it was just like, I mean it was, you know, and, and the experience varies from place to place because based on, you know, what the environment lends itself to and I'll try to choose like the route that I'll, you know, walk, uh, take people on based on like the experience that it'll, you know, give. So, you know, in Portland, like my, my first walks, they were really in these places that like my common walking routes on campus. Um, you know, when I go to do a walk in a different place, uh, you know, that I'm not familiar with, I'll just have to find my way and kind of like get comfortable walking independently in a place and then, you know, just piece together this experience. The image that you're looking at now um, is from, uh, it was a residency that, residency that I did at Haverford College um, and connected to this exhibition. And so for that walk, I basically, I knew, I picked a destination for where my walk would end, but I didn't necessarily know how to get there. So, um, and if you were to walk from where we started to the destination, which was the, the running track, track and field uh, running track, it would take about like just over five minutes to get there by walking. But with this walk, I, I took this little group on this walk, and my first try, we ended up taking an hour and 45 minutes. <laughs> and we finally, this is the destination. This is like when we finally got to the running track, and we were like just so happy. 
Um, <laughs> and, and the next walk, the next day, which was like, I was trying to still get to the running track. It was during the day, though. And, um, and it ended up taking 45 minutes. So I kind of cut that time down a bit, but it's still like really like way too much time. Um, here's images from other walks. This was a group at the California College of Arts. These are students. That was a walk like at the California College of Arts where like the first walk where a, a lot of people showed up. So it's about 50 people. It's another image from that. Um, and this is a, an image from my, f my first walk for like an art event in, in Portland. So that was like, you know, Carmen a bunch of years younger. Um, finally, I, you know, ended up like after doing a lot of these walks, I tried to figure out like different ways of like documenting them and then I tried to figure out like where else can I bring this practice and I started bringing people into the museum and, and tried to figure out like how, what would happen if people were experiencing the museum where it's like super visual, like w with their eyes closed. And, um, and, and the first iteration of this project was when I, um, I invited my friends to, who, who I knew in Portland, just people who I, I had been to the museum with and who had like shown me around. And basically they would like just describe based on their subjective view of whatever was there, um, you know, artwork as well as like architecture or, you know, sometimes they would even, you know, my friends like would describe other museum visitors, like there's a guy over there in front of this painting or whatever. And so I essentially just did that exact same thing in a museum for like this, this event called Shine a Light at the Portland Art Gallery and, um, and chose like about 10 friends um, you know, all with different like interests and experiences uh, to lead public tours where the visitor could just like, you know, uh, hold on to uh, one of my friend's, you know, elbows and then they would just get this like, you know, uh, visual description tour, just, just really subjective descriptions of whatever was in the museum. And like some of my friends would spend a lot of time with an artwork and just like describe it in detail. Some people would like, you know, kind of, you know, invite people to sit on the ground um, and just like use the museum spaces, the gallery spaces in alternative ways to like just like see how that changed the viewing experience. And, you know, since I've been able to do a project at the Whitney as well, and um, this is the project that I, I called See For, for Yourself. Um, and, um, but it's kind of, now I think of it like See For Yourself is like, like a project group that includes other stuff too. Um, eventually I started doing like work that was based in other non-visual sensory experiences. So um, in 2013, I was lucky enough to work with Georgia Krantz at the Guggenheim. And I ended up developing this like participatory tour um, called the Touchy Subject. And usually like the touchy subject in a museum is that you can't touch anything. Um, and so basically what I did was I negotiated with the museum to have a few objects from the collection to, um, available for, for touching by the general public. So, you know, these are objects that, you know, sometimes like as a blind or visually impaired person, like they go to a museum, um, they, you know, might have the opportunity to touch certain things. And the idea is that you'll touch this object and then you'll get a sense of how it looks, which is kind of, I don't know, it's sort of like a, like a, I don't know, it's a weird translation in some ways. And like I never could make that mental leap to, oh, this feels like this, therefore it looks like this. So I just developed this tour where, um, you know, I worked with museum educators and we spent time with these objects from the collection and we were feeling them and like kind of just spending time like what would we call, you know, uh, how would we describe this uh, texture and how would we describe that texture and we just developed like this vocabulary of tactile experience um, with all these ob objects. And then those educators led tours where the visitors to the Guggenheim could just 
you know, walk with, you know, linking arms with, with an educator and close their eyes and their hand would be directed to tactile points of interest. So that was like the building itself, which is like a sculpture in and of itself um, with all the curves and spirals and then objects to the objects from the collection. So it was just like this tour that was strictly based on on touch and, and the idea behind that was to really develop the tactile sense as a way of interpreting like could we develop our you know could we have if we had more practice using our non-visual senses would that influence the way that we interpret things and make you know and and the way that we make choices and you know I I tend well I think that we've had so much experience and so much practice with um, with looking and interpreting via the visual sense that we, um, you know, now we have like language for those experiences. And our, the way that we interpret is very sophisticated because we spent so much time with it. And, you know, the museum emerges as this thing. It's like, you know, a very visual experience where you kind of get the practice to learn how to interpret visual information. And, um, and I just like thinking about like, what if we replace that visual experience with a tactile experience or listening? Um, how would that, how would culture evolve? How, how would, you know, people design things? Um, this was a related uh, program that I did at MoMA uh, where I, it was essentially a, a, a um, series of focused listening ex um, tours. So I chose like three different places within the gallery um, that had different soundscapes and just led like, in, you know, intentional listening in those galleries. And while we were walking to and from these different locations, we would be plugging our ears and then unplugging when we got to the destination. And that, that's a practice that's called um, ear cleaning. And it was developed uh, by R. Murray Schaefer, who is like this composer and like acoustician. Um, in the 60s started this thing called the World so Soundscape Project where it was just like getting a group of researchers together. And this was in Vancouver actually too at the university that I graduated from. Um, got these people together who would just spend time in acoustic environments and like say, you know, record sounds um, because, you know, cities were developing and a lot of sounds were dying and sound kind of like relates to the identity of a place. So um, they wanted to capture these sounds before they, they were gone. Um, and through that practice, you know, a whole vocabulary emerges for how we can describe, you know, sound experiences. So I really was intrigued about that. So I kind of like adopted one of their, their exercises for the project at MoMA. Okay. Um, how much time do I have left? Okay. Okay. I'll quicken up then. I have to skip some things. Sorry. I really wanted to show you this. Sorry. Is that a talk? Yeah. I Me mean, giving a talk or something? Yeah. Okay. Well, oh yeah. So I've been writing. Part of my practice too is like writing about accessibility and trying to figure out like, you know, we have policy-based models for access. This is like, you know, after the Americans with Disabilities Act was kind of like, you know, trying to like ensure access and equality for folks who, you know, have particular needs. But like that, you know, only goes so far. You know, what happens when you have needs that don't fall within those parameters? So I like, you know, I, and I don't have an answer about what, you know, what other model w might work, but I kind of like, you know, write about that sometimes. So, you know, over the last few months I've been writing about what I've been calling open access and like through my community and like, you know, the people I know through my work and my practice, just sharing these ideas about open access. Um, I've just been able to have all these you know, interesting conversations about how would that look in a museum space or how might we, you know, kind of like uh, establish like openly accessible space in a community. Um, and yeah, so 
one of my friends that I, I shared this open access position statement to, uh, his name's uh, Megan Johnston, and she's the director of the Model Contemporary Art Center in Sligo, Ireland. And so she ended up using some of the tenets of this open access like concept that I've been developing um, as the, you know, in, infuse that into the vision for the institution at the model under her kind of like rule or whatever. Um, and she, yeah, and ended up building this residency program called the Bureau of Radical Accessibility related to some of the ideas that I was proposing. And so I got to be the first resident at the model um, to make projects and to share my work. So that's me um, in that space. Um, and I'd like to share just that, um, actually no, sorry, you're gonna get the opportunity to see a lot of the things that I would have wanted to share uh, in the gallery, if you like. So um, this is, when I got to the Model Center, I actually like found that it was like really hard to navigate. Like I wasn't, like the, you know, the video about the mobility device thing at the Victorian Albert Museum, I wasn't able to like navigate the museum independently. And so I wanted to like figure out how I could just like tackle my access in this real DIY way, like some, something that was easy to implement that would be really helpful. So I ended up tying a red string, um, like basically uh, on an object or on, you know, some fixture in the museum and then stringing it um, that in such a way so it indicated like a route that I would have to take regularly while I was in the gallery you know, as a resident artist. So this was like maybe the table that I would like sit at at the cafe and the string would go all the way up to like the, you know, second floor gallery where I was working on a project. And I would just like use this string to find my way through the museum. So I just say like, can someone direct me to the red string? Then I'd use it as like a tactile wayfinding um, tool while I was there. And it was just a really quick thing that I could do. Another intervention that I did was there was this, um, and it was a rehang of a permanent collection gallery. So all the wall hung objects were only inches from the ground. And, and my idea for doing this, like the, you know, the reason for doing this was that I feel like the, the viewing experience has become very passive. Like we don't really kind of like, I don't know, like it's not something that we, ch like we don't choose how to like enter the work really and like we just kind of like take for granted the way that you know the museum presents it is the way that we should be you know experiencing it so I wanted to like kind of switch that up in a dramatic way so I lowered all the paintings so folks had to like kind of <laughs> crouch down to see them and and this idea came from you know conversations that I had with a friend and a disability a activist in Portland named Eric Ferguson. And Eric was the first person who introduced the, you know, idea, like, to, you know, really shared like some of the, you know, uh, I mean, first person who told me about disability art and like the disability community and, you know, who was doing cool stuff. And, um, and we were just taught, we had these conversations where we were like, well, what if the world was like, you know, what if we could modify the world to suit the way that we want to experience things based on our own embodiments. And for Eric, like Eric is a wheelchair user and um, is also a dancer um, and does like buto dance, which is like this like style of dance that's kind of like hunched over and low to the ground and spends a lot of time like crawling and kind of rolling around on the ground as like a means of like performing dance. Um, so thought it would be really interesting to have the work at like, you know, kind of that, that level that kind of like, you know, encourages people to spend time closer to the ground and really has people like work for the viewing experience. And yeah, the last image I want to show you is this. This is something I'm super excited about now. I recently, just like a couple weeks, a few weeks ago, um, um, went to Olin College in uh, Nita, Mass Massachusetts. Um, and I'm working with students there, um, a team of students under Sarah Hendren. And Sarah's like a, a really cool lady. Uh, she like kind of headed up the redesign of the International 
symbol of access, which is like the wheelchair symbol. And so now, and, and MoMA ended up buying the design uh, for their permanent collection um, uh, from her. And it's basically this like crowdsourced kind of like design concept for the wheelchair symbol, um, where the, the figure on the symbol looks like they have more agency and they're kind of, you know, it kind of like communicates independence and like agency. So um, that's the kind of work she does. So she invited me to participate in this series where she does like this thing called design for one. So like it's, it's like she'll design, she'll work on a design project to like problem solve one person's needs like, and, and the person's need, needs have to be like, they have to have atypical, an atypical body. Um, and she calls this uh, investigating normal. So, you know, flipping the idea of normal to be something that includes like all sorts of embodiments and identities and learning styles and positions and whatever. So what we're doing is, um, she, her students are building me an acoustic mobility device. And so I spent like about a week there and students were proposing all these like really amazing kind of like solutions for the problem of the white cane that I still haven't figured out how to modify in a way that I'm happy with. Um, and, um, and the one that I'm showing you here is they mic'd up my canes and hooked it up to like an amp and a distortion pedal and like a, and like a looping pedal. So like I could like use tap my cane and then you, it would like amplify the sound and I could play with the sounds and stuff. So you'd get this direct like, you know, texture turning like instantly into into a sound and and it was just but it's it was like you know very like beginning of the process prototype so i'll be working with the students over a year to develop something that's actually a working new thing that i can use in performance or whatever <sighs> yeah that's my talk thanks <laughs> Uh, explain what social practice is uh, in yeah. contemporary growing, a growing field. Yeah. So social practice is like a non-object based like art practice. It's, it's, you know, it's, a, it's more, I guess it's, it's gained popularity in the last like 10 years probably, like really more so in the last five years. And um, it's where like, you know, it'll, it, it, you develop experiences or, or projects that require like, you know, some kind of degree of participation and you won't focus on like making an object as the like, you know, product of the piece or like the, you know, the point of the piece, but it'll just be like this process that you're working with a group of people and like, you know, going through an experience together and you find ways to document that and show that and that's kind of how I identify my work. Any more questions? I have a question. Yeah. Um, earlier in the talk, you mentioned uh, was compiling a list that um, that you read aloud from a Facebook page. Mm -hmm. uh, is that Facebook page open to the public? Is it friends? Is it? It's friends. Uh, I yeah, and it was just like this thing I posted like I don't know maybe a few months ago, and yeah, but I'm happy to yeah I'm available on Facebook and can join and contribute if you'd like. But, um, but since then, like I took some of those objects and, and when I was at the Victoria and Albert Museum, I pulled objects from the collection that kind of related to that list. Sword, uh, magic wand, like, uh, uh, what else was there? There was all sorts of stuff. Oh, sorry? Diddly do. <laughs> no, there wasn't any of those in the collection, but some of them were, you know, yeah, they had this and that. Um, and so I, I spent time with those objects and kind of, there was a photographer and I, I, try, I just spent time in a studio trying to realize their potential as mobility devices. So I held them and like kind of like played with them and, you know, and the sword was really cool <laughs> because, <laughs> and, it, and you know, because it, re, you know, it, it's funny because like this design doesn't account for the, you know, the protection of my hand, which I'm constantly scraping on like cement walls and like all sorts of stuff and the you know the sword had this like beautiful hilt that just like 
kind of solve that problem. <laughs> <laughs> Talked about it, but have you ever worked with like a 3D printer to create pieces of artwork? No, I haven't. Um, I don't know much about 3D printing. I'm kind of trying to wrap my head around it and see like what the applications might be. But yeah, I think that could be interesting. Like using, I mean, I know in museums, like they use 3D printers to make like representations of artworks that are kind of like not able to be touched. Uh, but that, yeah, so I think there's like a lot of applications like that if you want to make like reproductions and stuff, but I haven't yet. <laughs> uh, I know cause you were showing some pictures of the museum and uh, in our library we have a 3D printer mm -hmm. and we have a, a 3D printed out version of the aquarium in the oh, library. Oh, cool. And it was, I kind of thought that would be a way to be able to kind of see architecture. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, that's, it's an interesting idea. Like when I did this project at the Guggenheim, um, it was through this program called Mind's Eye and this woman, Georgia Krantz, that I was working with, she um, developed this project for communities of blind and visually impaired people or non-visual learners and basically ask them how they would like to experience the museum. And then she like gathers resources and makes that happen and like one, of the people that she was part of that group actually said like I I would like to feel my way through the Guggenheim like um, you know like through a scale model and so she actually developed a scale model of the Guggenheim for that purpose but it's something now that like other people can use too and enjoy so yeah I think that probably was 3d printed yeah Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> I cut you off. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. Yeah, so it's been like a f bunch of years like where I've had to learn how to do things differently and really, again, like accept the things that I have access to and like really not use vision as like the goal anymore. And like, yeah, with the walking tours, I think it is an opportunity for people to practice moving through a space without using vision like what and using their non-visual senses and like I don't know I like to think of those projects as you know the museum project at the Guggen Guggenheim and, and at MoMA as like practice for people in developing their non-visual senses so they're viable options for learning about a place or interpreting things like a couple of things you said um, one about like the design for one and that's mm -hmm. so sort of horizontal and you really think that education is going to move more like education for the actual human and not just like for the, a general yeah. uh, part and some of that is you know that some people like some people are um, you know they learn from hearing mm -hmm. uh, they learn from moving and so by thinking that out you know it's not really about unless we all are like mm -hmm. you know nor it's normal for us to all be incredibly different yeah definitely and and this is something I didn't get to share because of the time but like the open access statement that I wrote really gets into that I try to like identify the tenants for what would like a really like liberated space be like how would we achieve that uh, in a community and I really think that it is a intervention of a disabling power structure like I, I talk I think a lot about power structures and power dynamics and how they can like you know in, it improve people's agency or like support folks um, and, and and on the other hand like disable folks too like because you know I, I feel like you know and and I prescribe to this like thing called the social model of disability and a lot of folks who are identify as disabled also identify as disabled under the social model, which is something that you all probably don't know much about because we don't have like a, 
I don't think society and culture is there yet, but I think folks who know disabled folks and are part of disability communities, this is kind of like common knowledge where it's this idea that came out of the late 70s in London and other places too, where folks started to think about like, what is actually going on? Like, how am I disabled and why am I disabled? And so instead of being like something in the body that is disabling a person, like the social model identifies like a, it's a complex set of like, social and cultural conditions that d disable folks. And so, you know, that, that's like discrimination, like marginalization, um, the fact that I don't have access to the library or an easy access to the library, um, or, or can't participate in certain things. That's the stuff that really disables me because I can always curate a situation and modify my environment to be accommodating of my needs and my you know, my learning style if we're talking about a school. Um, but it's not like my body that's the problem. It's kind of like the social model basically, like, you know, it, it's, it's more of a marker of where society is at instead of like, you know, the status of one's body. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's one of the ten, ten, yeah, like I think that's an easy way to describe like why should people care about this stuff? Well, I mean, one, normal is like, like, <laughs> you know, the diversity of difference and particularity that is this group sitting in this auditorium. And it's also the fact that you know, when, if we're talking about the body, that yeah, people get older, their bodies change, and you know, your environment has to change um, to accommodate for that. And you know, that's why like curb cuts, like when you know, the kind of like ramp that you know, pe folks who are wheelchair users can use, but also like are easier for folks who have limited mobility can use. So yeah, it's, I think like this idea of like physical access, but also like just access in general, is like, I, I, I tend to think it's something that everybody, you know, kind of like could benefit from because like, I feel like, you know, in thinking about open access and openly accessible spaces and like liberated spaces that are non-oppressive and that are empowering um, and that you can like realize your agency, like they're very rare. Like I, you know, I, I've asked even folks in the disability community, like some of the people that I think are doing the most interesting work about like, do you know a place that, you know, are you aware of some organization or a place or some, some community group or organization that, like, you know, where, where, that you could describe as radically accessible and, like, there's very few places. <laughs> so I think, I think that's why I want to share, like, something like my ideas around open access because I think it's something that we just do through building relationships with others. And like, if we set those terms intentionally, then we can live in a community of support. Um, but usually, we, yeah, we're not asked about what we want. And like, you know, people, people don't usually think that they can offer what it, like those particularities or those the things that, that, that would allow them to, to thrive, so. Any other questions? I would like to ask uh, the, if there are any written uh, descriptors here, students who did written descriptions. Is anyone here? Can you stand up? Let's hopefully not <laughs> let's uh, let's go on up.